All right, guys, welcome to uh, Wednesday night service tonight, the Hour of Power, as we call it. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, I know, uh, you know Pastor's out of town right now. Him and uh, Miss Janie are enjoying their 37th wedding anniversary trip. I mean, 37 years, that's a long time. And uh, glad they're having some fun and relaxation and all that good stuff. Um, but tonight, what I want to do is I want to talk with you guys uh, something that's kind of been really kind of on my heart lately because of all the things going on in the world and politics and all that stuff. Um, it's one word I really want to focus on, and that's identity. Okay. Um,
Christ. Whenever you, you know, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, mouth that Jesus is Lord, you become a new creation, new creature. Okay, we call that the new birth. Uh, it's one translation, I can't remember exactly which one. It says, basically, you have become a, uh, a brand new species never before seen on earth. So you are a completely different person once you become born again. Okay? And so, with that being said, now we've got to figure out, what, what, what do we have to do with that? Because if we're somebody completely new, how does that affect us as you know, now Christians or now you know, born again believers, new birth type people? Okay? Um, so, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about... <laughs> So um, as I started thinking about this, um, you know, God speaks to us all in different ways, right? Um, whatever your interests are, whatever, you know, ways that you associate with things, that's the way God's going to talk to you. And uh, my old pastor back in Oklahoma, he was a um, craftsman by trade, a mechanic type person, you know, worked with his hands. And so he always kind of related to everything that God talked to him about and the way he related, the Holy Spirit related things to him was to like mechanicals and building and stuff like that, right? Um, for me, um, you know, history is one of those things, but also my experience in the military, uh, just because there's so much of that groundwork that was laid there that translates actually into, you know, where we are here. So I started thinking about, um, my thing about identity was whenever I first got to boot camp. Um, Mr. Joe, you're in the military, right? Army, so you, you kind of know what I'm talking about. The other guys, just kind of bear with me here, and I, I have a point to this. Let's, I'm just going to put it that way, all right? Um, so, of course, you know, I'm from Oklahoma, so we left out of Oklahoma City at about 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, September 21st, 2004. Yes, I do remember the exact date and all that stuff. <laughs> um, so we left about 10 o'clock in the morning, Oklahoma City, direct flight to O'Hare, Chicago. Uh, boot camp is in Great Lakes, Illinois, which is about an hour north, I believe, of Chicago. And so we were given instructions that once we got there, get to O'Hare Airport, find the USO office, and wait there until you know, further instruction or whatnot. So um, there's only about five of us on that flight. But we got to the USO office, we get there, and there's, you know, there's a couple people here and there and stuff like that. And we didn't realize that we would be waiting for you know, about six or seven hours, waiting for all the people from all over the country to, you know, converge on this one point before, you know, we got to Great Lakes. Um, so, um, once everybody finally arrived, it's probably about, it's close to 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, and so we're thinking, all right, they're going to bust us up there, we're going to get some sleep, start fresh in the morning. No, no wrong, okay? Um, we get there about, probably about 11 o'clock, it's close to midnight. And as soon as we're off the bus, I mean, it's like, go. I mean, we're just go, 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 go. And there's so many different things they have to do in that, you know, first few hours. You got to get everybody divided, got you know, get all this stuff issued to you and all that stuff. And um, the part that sticks out in my head the most, because it was such a blur, I mean, it really was a blur, was going into this room. It's probably about the size of this room and that room together. And there's 88 of us all crammed into this room. And we're all lined up on these like tables, and in front of us is this box. This is plain cardboard box. So we're sitting there, and they come by and they hand us like this bundle, and it's got uh, sweatpants, sweatshirt, uh, underwear, white shirt, socks, shoes, all this stuff, right? And so they basically told us strip down, put everything you own inside of that box, wait for the instructions. And so I'm like, okay, so I stripped down to my underwear, and I'm not trying to get like, graphic or anything, but I stripped down to my underwear, you know, and I'm like, okay. So then I start putting my sweatpants on, and this drill instructor comes up to me, and he's like, no, everything. And I'm like, 
can't even keep my underwear. <laughs> you know? So by the end of it, you know, you have 88 guys who have all of their stuff, all of their former life, all of their clothes has now been taken off and put into this box that we address to home, and they ship it off for us, and that's it. We are now, we're in it. Okay? So everywhere we go now, we've got to be in either these sweats and, you know, that, this PT gear that we have, or later on we get issued uniforms and all that stuff. And that's when I thought to myself, this is it. <laughs> it's for real now. You know, like, there's nothing. I have nothing. I, the, even the clothes off my back are gone. They, they've given me everything I needed. And as we walked out that room, they handed each of us this uh, ball cap, like a, like a hat. It's black and in big yellow letters that said recruit. That was our identity for the next two months, next eight weeks. We were recruits. Couldn't even call ourselves sailors yet. But we were recruits. We were lower than low, that sort of stuff. I mean, that's, that's who we were, right? And so the point I'm trying to get to is this, is that we had 88 guys in that division, okay, Division 4, 3, 4. And that's 88 people from different parts of the United States, from different backgrounds, different identities, and now we have to come together to function as one unit, to conform to what the United States military says we need to conform to, you know, accomplish these things, and then, then we become sailors. Okay? I'll get back to that in a minute. So go ahead and turn over to um, Genesis chapter 17. Because all throughout the Bible we see uh, God is taking men and women and he's completely changing their course. He's taking who they were, telling them who they were going to be or who they are now, and they go on and do great things, right? Okay, so I want to look at a couple of these first. Obviously, you can go through the entire Old Testament, the entire New Testament. You can find probably hundreds of examples of these types of people. These out for time's sake and for, we know who they are. So in Genesis chapter 17, starting verse 1, now I'm reading out of the NLT. Um, I usually use the New King James, but this, well, so. All right, so Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. Covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abram fell uh, face down on the ground. Then God said to him, this is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am your name. You will no longer be Abram, and said you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. So, what did God do with Abraham? Changed his identity, changed who he was, right? He even changed his name. He's no longer Abram, now he's Abraham, which Abraham is translated to father of many nations, right? So, now, how old is Abraham, Abraham at this point? How old? 99. 99 years old. Now, I don't know too many 99-year-olds out there who are, you know, being the father of many nations, okay? So, naturally speaking, this is kind of impossible, right? Okay, but how many, how many of you know that with God anything is possible? And he made the promise, right? Now we know going through this all, you know, he, uh, him and his wife could not get pregnant, so she offered up the servant, and then you have the whole, you know, debacle there and everything. But eventually he gets it right. And, you know, the, the promise was fulfilled. He became the covenant, you know, uh, they became in the covenant with God, and the Jewish nation was formed out of that, right? But Abraham, Abraham had to embrace who he was now. He couldn't just kind of go on willy-nilly and stuff like that, as we saw with, you know, the servant. Like, he didn't kind of do what God told him to, and so now, you know, we still have issues with, with that today. Um, but he embraced it, finally, and now, you know, he fulfilled his promise, and we know what happened from there. Go ahead and turn over to Judges, chapter 6. This character is uh, 
He's one of my favorites in the Bible. Uh, this guy and Elisha. Like, I've studied them a lot, and I really, I don't know, I just, I like these two guys. Um, so this is the story of Gideon, and I said, I know you guys probably heard the story of Gideon before, but we're going to go over it again. So, uh, so Judges chapter 6, so we start in verse 14. And now remember here, um, sorry, um, Israel has been captured by the Midianites. Um, because we know through judges they, you know they they do good, and then they start backsliding, and then they get taken captive, and then they cry out, and God sends a judge, and they rescue them, and everything's good, and then they start backsliding again, and then it's just back and forth. Okay, that's pretty much the entire Old Testament. But all right, so this is another one of those times people are crying out, and so God goes down or sends the angel of the Lord first to Gideon and says, you know, rise up, you're going to, you know, take back. Israel from the Midianites. And Gideon's like, I don't know about that. You know, it's like, I don't think I can do that. So in verse 14, the uh, Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Okay? So Gideon here, calling himself weak, he's from the weakest tribe, the least of his family, he does not feel like he is worthy to you know, do this task. He doesn't think he can do it at all. Um, but, you know, when God says something, that's totally different than what we think, right? I can think of many times in my life where, like, I, I can't do that. Well, but God said, so guess what? I got through it because it was his calling, not mine. And whenever he calls you to do something, he gives you the strength to do it when you rely on him, when you put your identity there. Because here's the thing, guys. Like pride, whether it's ego or whether it's thinking like too low of yourself, that's a form of pride because you're thinking of yourself. You're thinking, I'm not worthy to do this. I can't do this. I, I, I. Okay, that's a form of pride. So we get in, in pride, that's no longer your identity. Now my identity is cap. It's no longer Christ. But when I look to what he said and what his word says, I identify with Christ, now I can do what he's called me to do. But anyway, sorry. So anyway, um, so we know the story with Gideon. Um, you know, like, here's the funny, but you know, the Lord appeared to him. Angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, you know, go. And he's like, okay, I, but I still don't believe you, so I need a sign. So, you know, he goes through all this, you know, a couple chapters worth of signs, you know, the fleece and all this other stuff. And, you know, we know we're not supposed to use that as a reference for figuring out what we want from God, but anyways, it happened. Okay, it's Old Testament, so it's different. So finally, he got the, he got the picture. He's got 300 men, and guess what he does? What does he do? He takes Israel back from the Midianites, right? With just 300 men. We're talking about a whole nation of people. And you have Gideon plus 300, takes them all out, and brings the Jews back. Why? Because God called him to do it, right? God gave him a new identity. You're not the weakest in your clan anymore. You're not the weakest in your family. You are now strong in me because I am with you. My spirit is upon you. So you can accomplish anything, right? All right, so next two I want to talk about are New Testament. So we know about these two guys, right? Peter and Paul? All right, so I need your help again here. What do we know about Peter? Who was he? What did he do? He's a fisherman. It's his identity, right? What else? Is it disciple? He's one of the twelve, right? Walked with Jesus. What else do we know about him? <laughs> Had a temper. 
potty mouth. <laughs> right? Because well, after Jesus was crucified, you know, they talked to him and everything. He'd, he'd cuss them out saying, I don't know this blankety blank, blank, blank. And, right? So. <laughs> cut an ear off. Okay? So, as a fisherman, what can we say about his education? Probably none, right? Because this is more of a trade, right? All right. So I say non-educated in just like a formal sense. He probably didn't have a formal education, right? Okay. So that's Peter. What about Paul? What do we know about him? Very educated, right? Yeah, education. Who did he study with? Anybody remember? Emil. Yep. I'm going to say G, because I don't know how to spell that at the moment. <laughs> what else do we know about him? Hey, a little bit of a temper. We'll say religious temper. What else about him? Christian killer. He was. He started out that way. What else? What's that? Disciple of Christ. Yeah, eventually, right? One, one of the original 12, but I hope I'm spelling that right. <laughs> Disciple. All right, now, in Acts, when we look at Acts, who did Peter preach to? The Jews, right? He went to the Jews. What about Paul? Gentiles. Where? Gentiles? One, one verse that I love about Peter is in Acts. I can't remember exactly where it is at the moment. I didn't write it down. But um, where they were brought in for preaching Christ. And he sent him away making a note that, you know, he was an unlearned man, but he had been with Jesus, right? So even though he was not educated... Had a little bit of a temper, a potty mouth, sailor, right? What happened to him? He got a new identity, right? Because he accepted Jesus. He was up in the upper room, they filled with the Holy Ghost, right? He came down a totally different person, and he embraced that identity in Christ. Now, Paul, we know he started off um, as you know the Jew of Jews. As he said himself, you know, I was a Jew of Jews, you know, from the tribe of Benjamin. But, you know, he laid out everything that he was, right? Very educated, knew the Jewish law, studied under this guy who was probably, the, you know, the greatest mind of, you know, Jewish thought at the time. Okay, studied at his feet, as he said. Right? And where does he go? That doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't. Because in our thinking, he should have went to the Jews, right? Because he was educated. He knew the Jew. He knew the religion. He knew um, all the rites, the, the ritual. He knew everything about Jewish history. He knew uh, the Old Testament forward and backwards. So common sense tells us Paul should have went to the Jews. Peter probably should have went to the Gentiles, right? God had a different plan, though, right? So what if Paul did not embrace that identity? that calling which you know Jesus and God put on him, what would have happened maybe if he would have went to the Jews instead? I would argue a lot. Okay. I mean we don't really, we don't know obviously because but probably got stoned, yeah. <laughs> That's very yeah, very true. And he got stoned a couple times even going to the Gentiles, but um, whipped a few times and beaten with a rod. Left for dead. Anyway, I say in Second uh, Corinthians, you got that whole long list of all the tribulations that Paul went through. That's, he had a rough life, right? But how did he get through it? He knew his call. He knew in him I can do all things. In my weakness, he's my strength, right? 
Okay? So, Paul went to the Gentiles, again, beyond all logical reasoning or whatever, he was sent to the Gentiles. And what happened? He wrote half of the New Testament. Established churches all across Asia and Europe and Greece. And, you know, wanted to go even further, but couldn't. But he established what he needed to establish, what God told him to do. And we have Christianity today because of what he did. Okay? Now, Peter did what he was told as well, right? He was very successful in what he did. We don't hear about Peter as much because after Paul comes onto the scene and acts, you know, Luke was following him, and so that's where we get most of our... But he was successful. Successful enough to where he was called the first pope by the Catholic Church, right? Okay? So much so that he's buried underneath the Vatican, you know, as a saint, martyr, all that sort of stuff. So Peter did his job, even though we don't hear much of him, because God told him to go here, even though it doesn't seem like he should have, right? All right. All right. So how does this apply to us? That, that's kind of what it comes down to, right? How, how do we apply this in our lives? We'll turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. So again, who wrote the book of Ephesians? Gabby? Paul, yeah. <laughs> so Paul, the man who went to the Gentiles, writes this letter to the church at Ephesus. All right? Now, is our F, are the Ephesians Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. Yes, Gentiles. Okay. So, again, Paul's doing his, his work. He establishes a church there. Um, eventually, Timothy becomes the head of that church. Um, but he's writing his letter to this church. And in it, in uh, chapter 4, verse 21, he says, If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So the key word here, or the key things here in verse 22, he talks about putting off our former conduct. So what does that mean? Put off my former conduct, what, would I, what, what, what does that look like? Put away the old nature, not doing what you were doing before. 180 degree turn, absolutely. Yep, okay. So, Paul is telling them, you know, you can't be doing these things that you were doing before. Okay, that's no longer who you are. You are no longer that sinful, um, destructive nature that was in the world before. You are no longer that person. In 2 Corinthians, he said, you are now a new creature, a new creation. So you have to act accordingly, right? Right, but how do we do that? The renewing of your mind. With what? With what? The Word. The Word. Exactly. Okay? The Word. That is the key. If you're not renewing your mind with the Word, now you could be renewing your mind. Okay? There's plenty of things out there you can renew your mind with. Lustful things. Um, there's even false doctrines out there you could be renewing your mind with. Okay? Deceitful lust. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Exactly. Okay? So there's other things. You can be renewing your mind with other things, but the key is the Word of God. This. Okay? Now, books, teachings, preaching, all that stuff, okay, those are good things. Paul talks about it in this same book in Ephesians. Okay? Teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, you know, the fivefold ministry, those are there to help you, to get you to that point, right? To, to bring to light the, the, the Word, the Scriptures, and stuff like that. But are they the authority? 
They are not the authority. The authority, first and foremost, is here. This is what we know as the authority. What this says goes. So if you get some crazy wacko talking about, you know, it's, it's okay to commit adultery if you're doing it for evangelistic reasons. <laughs> no. No. Okay? That's not right. Because it goes against the word. Adultery is against the word of God, right? Okay? So, always have to be renewing ourselves with the word of God. All right? And, you know, I've... There's people in the faith that I uh, respect very much, uh, who I listen to their teachings, and you know some things they say don't really settle right with me, okay? And you know whether that's inexperience or whatnot, you know. But I, you know, I try to search out and, and, and prove those things out, you know. And if what they said is wrong, do you throw out the whole? You know, teaching because of, you know, one wrong thing? Not necessarily. People miss it. People get it wrong. Okay, we're human, right? Uh, we're not going to be right 100% of the time. But this is always right 100% of the time. So if you can stay with this, you be able to pick out those things that aren't necessarily, uh, uh, that's, I'm going to put that on the back burner. Okay, but this stuff over here, is, that's good stuff. Okay, it follows this. So I'm going to go with that, right? Um, So, um, yeah, the mind is, you know, because we know when we get saved, you know, we have a threefold nature, spirit, soul, body, okay? When you get saved, which one of those is renewed? Spirit, right? Your spirit's born again, okay? Um, your body didn't change. I look exactly, well, a little heavier than I looked when I got saved, but, you know, I still look the same. Um, when I got saved, I didn't automatically come out and forget where I lived or who my family was or anything like that. So my mind was still the same, right? Even though my spirit was reborn. So the spirit part and the mind, or I'm sorry, the soul, the mind, thoughts, feelings, that sort of stuff, and the body, we have to bring those in line with our spirit man, right? Okay? And that's through the word and knowing who we are in Christ. Um... One thing I would, I know you guys probably have this, but this little mini book right here, In Him, my Brother Hagen, um, incredible little book. I mean, it's 32 pages long and full of amazing. Okay? Highly encourage you if you want to find out who you are, you know, who you are in Christ, this is great. Now, another thing that he does in this one, which I love, is that the last three pages are nothing but scriptures. Just scripture references of anything that was in him, by whom, all, you know, your, um, your authority, your rights, your responsibilities, all that stuff in Christ is all right here. Um, so, for me, what, what I felt the Spirit tell me whenever I first read this book um, was I had this Bible and um, to highlight every one of them. That's the only thing in this Bible it, that's highlighted is the in him scriptures, all hundred and something of them. And the Ephesians prayers, because you know, they're awesome too. But I don't, I don't highlight anything else in this. And I'm not saying this is what you have to do. I'm just saying this is what I've done. But I can go through here. I can start in John and start going through. Anytime I see a highlight, that's an in him scripture. That's an in him reality. That's something that I know that I have in Christ. Right? And so there's been some tough times where I've just started there and just gone through. And by the time you know you get about halfway through it, you start getting a little... Ooh, yeah, I can do this, you know. That's who I am in Christ, you know. Yeah, that's who I am. That's, that's, that's who my God is, you know, that sort of stuff. So you get, start getting excited and start building yourself up, right? Exactly, start building that spirit man up, right? And then your mind, your body start following suit. Okay, the more you build that up, that's the renewing of the mind. Um, but if you don't have this, I would definitely encourage you to get it. At least, you know, this part, the highlighting, that's up to you. That's just, again, this is something I did. Um, so, going back to my original story of being in boot camp, right? Um, so, you know, for eight weeks and five days, um, we're walking around with this recruit ball cap on, right? So, anybody who looks at us knows he's a recruit, 
That's who he is. He's a recruit. He's this. Now, as a recruit, there's certain things you can get away with because you don't know any better, right? Because, you know, like, you just go, oh, I didn't know, you know, and they'll let you go on your way. You may have to do some push-ups or whatnot. But there's also a lot of things you can't do. You know, we couldn't just leave and, you know, come and go as we pleased. We were with our division at all times, unless we were on watch somewhere. We were PTing together. We were showering together. We were cleaning together. All these things. I mean, this is all the stuff that we had to do as a unit, right? So the whole time, we're learning, right? First week was a disaster. I, was, I mean, you bring 80-plus men from all over the world with different backgrounds and all that stuff together, there's going to be some issues. I mean... You bring four people from different parts of the country together and put them in a room, there's going to be issues. Okay? Um, So there were issues. It took us a while to get to where we could be cohesive as a unit and that we started conforming to the standards and to what the Navy has asked us to do. I mean, you had to learn how to fold your underwear the correct way. You had to learn how to fold your shirts the correct way, how to make the bed the correct way. And if it's not done right, everybody's got to do it all over again. And you don't want to be the one whose fault it is that you had to do it all over again, right? So, you know, that's the whole thing, is that, that they're teaching us through all these eight weeks. Not only are we learning, you know, all the history and the, you know, the firefighting techniques and the, um, you know, shipboard stuff that we have to, you know, we're learning all these things, but at the same time, we're slowly being molded into what we're supposed to be. So that we're thinking together. We're thinking not of ourselves, but we're thinking of the person next to us and the mission at hand, that sort of thing, right? Now, at the end, we didn't have 88 people. We started off with 88. We only had about 70. So 18 people dropped off along the way at different points. A good bulk of them came a week later when they didn't pass the drug test. Go figure, right? (laughs) Okay? And then the rest of them dropped off because either they, they would not conform, they would not do what they were told to do, or they just couldn't do it physically, right? I'm going to tell you, as a Christian, you don't want to be one of those 18 people that fall by the wayside, okay? You want to be constantly conforming yourself to this image, to this identity. Because the more you conform here, and you get to the end of that race, of your race, you can walk up you know, boldly and say, I ran my race, just like Paul did. He said, you know, I've come to the end of my race, I've done what I've, you know, been called to do. He, know, he knew he did what he was supposed to do, right? So that's what I'm saying. You don't want to be one of those 18. You want to be one of those 70 that finish strong, right? That are doing what God has called you to do. Because if these two men, especially this one, hadn't done what God called him to do, where would we be as a church today? I mean, instead of... Here, to the Jew, we now have what we have. So that's the question is, you know, where are we going to be in the future if, you know, Mr. Dick or Mr. Joe or uh, Gabby or somebody doesn't fulfill their call? Where will we be? We don't know. But we know that if you don't fulfill your call, somebody's got to pick up the slack and people may not be reached, okay? And that's something you don't want to have to answer for, <laughs> right? You will be held accountable for it, absolutely. So, um, last verse I want to um, end with is Galatians 3.28. And simply, Paul, um, you know, the book of Galatians was written to uh, the church of Galatia. They were dealing with... Um, this thing called Gnosticism. Okay, G N O S T I A C S M. Okay, it's a doctrine that basically says, you know, Jesus never came in the flesh. Um, you know, so in that case, you know, our spirit is renewed, and so it doesn't matter what we do with these bodies because our spirit's already, you know, born again. And so it's basically what we're seeing today. Okay, with this, you know, grace message and stuff like that, this hyper. You know, it doesn't be doing in, in your body because it's corrupt. Your spirit is already renewed, right? 
So Paul is addressing these people, but he's also addressing other issues going on in the church. And in verse 28 of Galatians 3, he says, For there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ. So if we look at this, first of all, he says there's no longer Jew or Gentile. Okay, that is race. Okay? There's no longer the Jewish race, there's no longer the Gentile race. You are all one because you are Christian, you are in Christ. Your identity is here, not in the Jew or the Gentile. There's neither slave nor free. It's economic status. It doesn't matter if you're rich or you're poor. You're the same. You should be treated the same. You should be acting the same. And um, there's no longer male or female. There's gender. So race, gender, socioeconomic status, any of those things are not to be your identity. Just put those things off because that's the only identity you need to worry about, your identity in Christ. Okay. Now again, we know in the Bible they talk about the differences between male and female. You know, you know, the husbands are the head of the household, you know, these sort of things. Like there are differences there. But what he's talking about here is never to use those things to separate yourself from others. Never use race, never look down on somebody because they're poor, never treat them any differently because they're rich. There's a lot of people who treat rich people differently than poor people, especially in churches. Got a rich person coming into church, guess who's gonna get the special treatment? Why? They got the money, right? But Paul says we're not supposed to do those things. Because if we all identify here, then these things don't matter. Right? Okay. Um, that's all I have for you today. Um, I just encourage you to, I mean, just remind yourself every day, or whenever you, you know, you're not feeling it, like who you are in Christ. What Christ did for you. Because we have that authority, you know, and, and, and in that identity, we have so many things. We have, you know, we have healing, we have prosperity, we have authority, we have, you know, the grace to live the life that he's called us to live. Those are powerful things. And when we realize what those are, and we associate ourselves with that instead of the things that divide us, well, there's so much more we can do, right, be able to fulfill that call. Um, so uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and take up tonight's offering. Um, if you're out there in Facebook world and you would like to give, I believe it's coming up on the screen now, uh, through PayPal and um, Square Cash. Um, so if you follow those directions, if you feel like giving, um, you know, it would be very much appreciated. Um, appreciate everybody being with us tonight. And Father God, we just thank you for uh, those who are giving. Uh, Lord, we thank you that uh, they're blessed in their giving. You know, through your word, we know that uh, when they give, shall be given unto them, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And we thank you for that abundance and prosperity. In Jesus' name, amen. So until next time. Oh, hi. Mom, sister, aunt. <laughs> um, but until next time, uh, join us on Sunday. Um, we should get started around 11 o'clock. Love for you to join us and have a great rest of the week. Yeah.